is not happy with that, keep the cameras off and um, and obviously they can you can choose to leave if you want to. So I'll just wait for this to come on. OK, so we're now recording the session. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Tegan from um, Glyndur University. And Tegan is a second time presenting to us and with um, you know, it was a fantastic talk. We had so much feedback. It's so great to have Tegan back presenting. So Tegan's going to do a little taster lecture on nature versus nurture. OK, and obviously that's a massive topic for anyone studying criminology or psychology or sociology or stuff like that. So if you've got any questions, put them in the chat for us. I'm going to watch the lobby. I'm going to mute my mic so you don't get feedback, um, Tegan. And I'm going to switch my camera off, but I'm going to be listening and monitoring it. Um, and everyone put questions in the in the chat and I'll be monitoring those. Oh, fabulous. Thank you so much, John. And it's a pleasure to be back with you um, this year to deliver this session again. Thank you so much for joining um, tonight. As John said, I'm Tegan and I work for um, Glyndor University. So I'm a lecturer in policing, criminology and trauma informed approaches. Um, and the session that I'm going to do with you tonight is nature versus nurture, which as um, as you've heard, is a huge topic um, and one which is very prominent in the area of criminology. Um, I do have to apologise first and foremost. I've got a very noisy cat this evening um, who is just at the door crying and meowing constantly. So if you hear any background noise, that is the cat. Um, and just to let you know, I can't see um, I can't see any questions coming through when I'm sharing my slides. So um, if you want to unmute yourself or um, you know anything like that, or I can have a look at questions afterwards. Uh, more than happy to answer any questions that you may have from me. So we're going to do this is um, quite interactive, really. I won't force anybody to speak, um, but it'd be great to have you um, joining in the in the chat function. Um, we're going to have quite um, an interactive session this evening, um, and this session is going to explore the nature and nurture debate which exists in criminology by discussing some relevant case studies. Um, the case studies are quite sensitive, uh, so that is just a little warning um, if you've got your earphones in or um, you're sat anywhere where there might be younger ears that may not um, want to listen in on onto the case studies. But we're also going to look at the factors which might prompt offending behaviour as well. So what I like to do with this session is have a little bit of a warm up, um, get our brains thinking by doing a game of true and false. And what I want you to do is um, I want you to write your answers in the chat so I can have a look um, afterwards. So we've got a few questions um, and I just want you to pop in the chat whether you think it's true or false and then I'll, I will reveal all of the answers at the end. So the first is um, in Samoa, it is a crime to forget your wife's birthday. Is that true or false? I think even if it's um, whatever the answer is, I think it should be true because it should be a crime to forget your wife's birthday, in my opinion. OK, so let's put the answers in the chat, everyone. Yeah. They're not coming through yet. Yeah, it can take a little bit of time or, you know, if you would rather not put it in the chat, that's fine. You can just have a think, have a think about it as we're going through. They're coming through now. We've got two for false. Yeah, All right. three for we've got two for true and two for false at the moment. Brilliant. Three for false. Well, I'll, I'll surprise you. Um, it's true. It is a crime to forget your wife's birthday in Samoa. Um, there's all of these weird and wonderful laws that exist in the world and um, we're going to have a look at a few of those actually in this in this true or false game so you might be surprised um okay the second one in england it is illegal to hold a salmon under suspicious circumstances are we thinking that's true or false Lots of people are going for the opposite of what they think, I think, at the moment, because I think that this could be, so we could be looking quite silly here. Lots of people seem to be thinking true. OK, well, brilliant, because it is true. Sounds well, fishy, we are. like a pun. <laughs> um, it's true, and that is uh, thanks to the salmon law of 1986. Uh, you cannot hold a, a salmon under suspicious 
circumstances. I don't know what those circumstances would be. Um, wouldn't like to find out, so I'm not planning on um, buying salmon anytime soon. Don't want to break the law. OK, the third question. Chickens are allowed to cross the road in Georgia. OK, this one's causing chickens allowed to cross the road in Georgia. So we've got false, true so far. Real. Do you know what? I think we're going to have another one's coming in. We're going to have another true here. So with chickens, um, OK, so this one's false. It's illegal for chickens to cross the road in Georgia. Oh. And what that means simply is that the law wants all chickens kept under control. So if chickens aren't kept under control, then it could result in an arrest. And you, you will absolutely know that it will not be the chicken that will be arrested, but however, that it will be the person that owns the chickens. Um, so there you go. If you've got chickens in Georgia, just make sure you don't let them cross the road. OK, uh, number four, it is legal to eat mince pies on Christmas Day. Are we thinking true or false? Okay, we've got mostly we've got true. They're going for true for this one. A lot of them. Fabulous. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is true. So um, the only Christmas day on which eating mince pies was illegal was in 1644. Um, and that was because the 25th of December that year fell on a legally mandated day of fasting. So no food was allowed to be consumed on that day. So you're all right. Well done. Excellent. Okay. Number five, chewing gum was banned in Singapore in 1993. Now I have to, this is a little bit sneaky of me, so it's kind of like a trick, uh, tricky question. I muted. We got four trues and a false so far. OK, so whoever's false is absolutely correct. Um, uh, it is banned. Chewing gum is banned. This is why I said it's a little bit of a trick question. So technically, if you said true, you are right. However, it was banned in 1992, um, not 1993. So number six, you are allowed to give your baby any name in Denmark. Is that true or false? OK, three falses already. Three falses. Four falses. Oh, one true. OK, excellent. So um, it is a, a false. There is a list of 7000 government sanctioned names which you must choose. Um, otherwise, the baby does not get a name. So you have to pick out of those 7000. OK, uh, number seven. 35% of all popular music played on Canadian stations must be by Canadian musicians. What are we thinking? OK, we've got four true, five true so far. Five trues. Absolutely brilliant. Yes, it is true. So if you are a Justin Bieber fan, then um, Canada is the place to be for you. So number eight in British Columbia, it is legal to kill Bigfoot. Is this true or false? Right. True, false, true, true. Oh, a little bit of a mixture. So, yeah. um, OK, so this is false. It's um, actually illegal to kill Bigfoot if you can find him. So, you know, if people do find him, they just need to let him carry on and live his life. Um, it is illegal to kill Bigfoot. So two more questions. Uh, nine is you can get a fine of up to ten thousand dollars and two years in prison 
if you interrupt a wedding in Australia? Well, there's a pause on this one. Nothing so yeah. far, but I think this is a tricky one now. So we've got, we got two falses so far, one true, another one true. OK, so this is this is true. Um, yes, you will get a fine of uh, up to that amount um, if you interrupt a wedding. So when when they say speak now, forever hold your peace, it's best to stay quiet because um, you don't want to end up with a fine. So the final question that we have for you is it is illegal to place a stamp of the Queen upside down on a letter. This is also a little bit of a tricky one. OK, so we've got some trues and false. OK, so whoever said false is correct, um, which surprised me. I always thought that it was. Um, basically, the Treason Felony Act in 1848 makes it an offence to do any act with the intention of deposing the monarch, but it does not refer to stamps. So um, it's not an illegal practice to do so. So thanks, everyone, for joining in. Um, I hope you feel like your brains have had a nice warm up um, ready to start the session. So what we're going to look at um, look at today is um, an exploration of the nature and inertia debate which exists in criminology. We're going to look at two case studies and discuss some factors which might prompt offending behaviour. Um, so we're going to have a look now at what nature and nurture both mean. So you probably will have heard of these terms before um, but there are differences between the two. So Nature um, refers to our genetics um, and that's basically um, believes that our genetics will determine our behaviour. So our personality traits and abilities are in our nature. We are born to act in a certain way, whereas nurture is focused more on our surrounding environment. So our environment, upbringing and life experiences determine our behaviour and we are nurtured to behave in certain ways. So the real um, key debate is that we are either really born bad or we become bad when you're thinking about it with regards to criminology. So I just want you to pop in the chat. Um, what do you think? Do you think that some people are born bad? Do you think they become bad? Um, it would just be really interesting for me to, to have a look at the end um, and what you what you think. You might change your mind after the session or you might stick with what you've what you already think about that topic. Um, in the Middle Ages, the prevailing belief was that criminals were being overtaken or influenced by the devil. So medieval lawmakers derived harsh punishments in order to purge the criminal's body of the evil demon and to do God's work on earth. So what I wanted to show you was some of the punishments that um, were included um, when when there was a belief that the devil had taken over somebody's body. So first we have stocks and you probably again, you probably will be familiar and you see stocks portrayed in all sorts of films and TV shows, um, but the stocks were a public torture device that immobilized the feet of the punished person and they were usually placed in public spaces like um, the marketplace or squares and this was to allow members of the public to throw rotten food or other objects at the individual and people are also allowed to um, kick the individual spit on them and insult the person that was being punished so it was quite um it was a, a, a punishment that focused on embarrassment um, and uh, an uncomfortableness uh, rather than you know, um, anything that could lead, lead to any serious injury. Then in the middle we have the Scold's Bridle. So this is known by many names. This is known as um, a Witch's Bridle or Branks um, Bridle or just Branks. And it's a torture device and usually used on women that were accused of being loud, rude or common scolds as they were referred to. So often um, those women were also under the suspicion of witchcraft, which is why it's called the witch's bridle. 
and this device was used to stop them speaking and prevent them spreading gossips or scolds um, or to enchant people. So you can see in the picture there, it's not too clear, so I apologise for that, but it has an iron muzzle which is held by an iron frame and that's basically made to fit around the head. Um, and then you, what you can't see in that picture, but where the mouth is, is there's um, uh, an iron harness that goes inside the mouth of the person and it presses down on their tongue, which means that you're not able to speak when you when the skull's bridle is, is on you. Um, and some of those um, skull's bridles also had a bell attached to the top. And the reason that they did that was so that the punished person could attract more attention when walking around in public places. You knew that they were coming along, so people would then look at them. And again, that was um, that was about embarrassing the person, really. Um, so a very, very uncomfortable punishment. And then finally is um, flogging. So what you can see on there is um, the cat of nine tails. And flogging um, could be known by, again, many, many names, caning, whipping, um, and it's used on people who were deemed not be not working hard enough um, and also used in schools as well. So the, the one in the picture, the cat of nine tails, is um, similar to a cane, but it has nine knotted cords or sometimes rawhide. So what you might feed to your dog, um, the, the hard bits of what looks like bone um, attached to the handle and then they would deliver the bows di um, directly to the back of the person and then they would apply salt to the wounds to increase pain. So if you've ever wondered um, where the saying rubbing salt into the wound comes from, this would be your answer. Um, sometimes what they would also do was whip the soles of the feet um, rather than the back because then it would make it difficult for the person to uh, walk. So you can see that the punishments were quite harsh um, and really uh, uh, designed to embarrass the person but also to rid the devil from that person's body because that was the belief but in time individuals started to trust more in science rather than religion and so they started to question devil involvement in crime they started to think well actually is it is it um to do with the devil or is there something more going on here within criminology it all began in italy in 1871 with a meeting between a criminal and a scientist. So the criminal was a man named um, Joseph Fiella and he was a um, notorious thief and arsonist. And the scientist was an army doctor called Cesar Lombroso and he began his career working in mental health hospitals and had then become interested in um, crime and criminals. Um, and he did this when he was studying Italian soldiers. So what he was trying to do was pinpoint the differences between those with mental health issues, um, those who were criminal and those he termed as normal individuals. And he did this by um, examining Italian prisons and the people that were in Italian prisons. And what Lombroso found um, was that he uh, was talking to um, Villella and he found him really interesting because he was um, quite boastful of what he had done. He was quite proud of um, the crimes that he had committed. Um, and so once Villela had died, Lombroso conducted a post-mortem on him and discovered that um, uh, Villela's um, skull had an indentation uh, at the back. And this was what he, Lombroso, found um, in ape skulls as well. So Lombroso concluded from this evidence, as well as that from other criminals that he'd studied, that some were born with a propensity to offend and were also um, very reminiscent to throwbacks to early man. So what Lombroso said was that you could recognise a thief um, by identifying an expressive face, manual dexterity and very small wandering eyes. Um, whereas for murderers, they had cold, glassy stares, bloodshot eyes and um, big noses. Uh, so he what he did was he looked at physical traits of people and then um, uh, grouped them together with the type of crime that he thought that they would commit. However, what Lombroso um, also did was 
he looked at women criminals as well and he co-wrote his first book to examine the causes of female crime and concluded among other things that female criminals were far more ruthless than males they tended to be lustful and immodest um, they were shorter and more wrinkled and had darker hair and smaller skulls um, and he found that women who committed crimes of passion had prominent lower jaws and were more wicked than their male counterparts. So this was Lombroso's argument. And his theory of the born criminal dominated thinking about criminal behaviour in the late 19th um, and early 20th century. So this was a theory that was really um, started to become embedded into society. So in 1975, uh, research was conducted to explore biological theories of crime th further and it found that adoptees with criminal records had a higher proportion of biological mothers and fathers with criminal records compared to adoptees with no criminal record. However, the evidence for this um, wasn't fully reliable because not all individuals who were adopted are adopted straight from birth. It could be months or years later. So therefore, um, nurture could play a part in whether the child uh, became involved in delinquent behaviour, not just nature. So towards the end of the 19th century, uh, many individuals started to question the world around them, including the biological and psychological link to crime. Um, and for criminologists in particular, they became um, increasingly interested in the environmental and sociological aspects of crime. They started to really think, well, can we rely on um, biological theories only or is there other theories out there that could explain a person's behaviour? Um, one of the more stranger theories floating around in the early days is the thermic law of crime, which argued that violent crimes were more likely to occur in hot climates and break-ins and theft occurred more in colder climates. So if this theory proposes that the weather surrounding an individual may impact on their behaviour or criminal activity, we can start to think how sociological aspects or the way a person has been brought up might also cause crime. Um, and we can do this by looking at sociological causes of crime. Um, Amelie, um, Amelie Durkheim found two types of criminals. So. Um, what Durkheim did was he was um, studied um, those who committed crimes and they found that there was um, altruistic criminals, so individuals who were offended by the rules of society and therefore motivated by a sense of duty to improve society. So you can think um, an example of this would be Robin Hood. So Robin Hood obviously um, stole from the rich to give to the poor. Robin Hood was offended by the rules of society, so he wanted to change them. Um, the other type of criminal was the common criminal, and this was somebody who rejects all laws and disciplines and purposely violates law with no social considerations. Durkheim proposed that crime in society was inevitable because not everyone buys into the collective sentiments of society. So in other words, we don't all feel the same way. And we certainly do not express ourselves in the same way. We're all completely different. This then prompted the creation of many more theories of crime, as well as an interest into how a person's experience might influence their behaviour and what they believe about themselves. However, sociological and environmental theories of crime have been criticised too. Um, so what they, what some of the arguments that exist around sociological causes of crime is that working class crime is overestimated, um, which therefore labels many individuals who go on to lead really good, happy lives. Um, whereas middle class and white collar crime is often not considered by theories. So what we're going to do now, as I mentioned at the beginning, is look at a couple of case studies. Um, and I've chosen two different types of case studies. The first case study we're going to look at is um, somebody who was labelled as being born bad by the media. And then the second case study we're going to look at is somebody who was labelled as um, made bad by the media. So this is Dylan Klebold. And Dylan grew up in an upper middle class family, which was described as a loving environment. Um, his parents referred to him as their sunshine boy who was very loving and well behaved. 
he was actually enrolled for um, uh, in a program for gifted students and as he got older he also got a part-time job all in all it was quite a positive environment for Dylan to grow up in um, he was obviously well cared for by his family um, and had quite a lot of opportunity in terms of um, employment uh, doing work very very well in school he was quite quiet as a teenager. He was really interested in, in technology. And because of that, he didn't really fit in with um, with many of, of the other children at Columbine High School. So he developed a hatred of school and he made a friend, um, a boy named Eric Harris, who also went to the school and he shared the same view as Dylan. He didn't like school either. So what the two started to do was um, they adopted the style of the school's kind of outcast clique. Um, they would wear trench coats, um, dark clo uh, clothing, and uh, generally didn't really um, take a lot of care with their appearance. And they would kind of hang around the outside of groups. They wouldn't really ever um, talk to anybody in their class or um, get involved in any activities. So Dylan was really bright. He was considered as really, really um, bright but what started to happen was he didn't apply himself and he started to earn uh, mediocre grades. Uh, Dylan and Eric became interested in all things um, German and they wore swastikas and used to give the Hail Hitler salute while um, bowling or playing um, card games so they became quite um, fascinated by Hitler and they also liked playing violent um, first person shooter video games. So in 1998, during their junior year, the two were arrested after they broke into a van and stole some things out of the vehicle. They were both charged at the time with theft and um, criminal mischief and also criminal trespassing. It was their first offence and because of that they were enrolled into a diversion programme instead of going through the criminal justice system and this meant that they had to do community service and attend counselling. Um, but what happened was they were released a month early from the programme in February 1999 um, and that was because they both received glowing reports at the end of the programme and Dylan was called a bright young man who had um, a great deal of potential. Um, unfortunately, just two months later on the 20th of April, which happened to be Hitler's birthday, um, Dylan and Eric began their attack on Columbine High School. So they made bombs and planted them in the school's cafeteria. Um, those bombs were supposed to go off first, which they um, planned would then send students and teachers into the parking lot where then the two planned to shoot as many people as, as they possibly could. Um, then they intended to trigger more explosives. Um, they had some attached to Dylan's BMW and they planned to do that after ambulances and other help arrived but the bombs actually didn't explode when they planned them to. So they entered the school instead after 11 a.m. and they shot at anyone that they encountered on the school grounds. Um, they roamed the school for less than an hour and they killed 12 students and a teacher and also wounded more than 20 others. So this rampage ended around about midday, just after midday, uh, with both of them committing suicide in the library. So because the reason I talk about this case with Dylan is um, he was perceived as having a really positive upbringing. He was perceived as having a really positive environment around him and um, good opportunities to make a success of his life. And the media um, used that information and described him as being born bad. So they just thought there was no reason for him to become bad. He had a really nice life. He was therefore born bad. So the next case is uh, someone who was labelled as becoming bad. And this is Aline Warnos. So you might recognise um, Aline because there's a film about her which has been um, made about the case and it's called Monster. Uh, so it's quite a, a big film, but actually there's quite a lot of documentaries around about Aline Warnos as well, quite a few um, documentaries uh, about her life and um, her sentencing. So she was born on the 29th of February in 1956 in Michigan and um, she experienced quite horrific trauma in her childhood. 
um, her father had committed suicide whilst serving time in prison and her mother had abandoned um, Aline and her older brother Keith. So both of those were left with their grandparents. And Aline's grandma, uh, grandmother was alleged to be an alcoholic and her grandfather was um, accused of being quite violent with Aline. So uh, what Aline um, says is that she was um, physically and emotionally abused by her grandfather and she became pregnant in her early teens um, and this um, baby was given up for adoption. So during her teen life, Aline was also forced out of her home and lived in the woods and she began working as a prostitute. So from late 1989 into the fall of 1990, Aline had murdered at least six men along the Florida highways. Um, in mid-December of that year, 1989, the body of Richard Mallory, who was the first victim, was found in a junkyard with five more men's bodies um, discovered over the subsequent months. Um, the police went to out into an investigation and um, eventually Aline was, was caught. Um, and during the trial, she asserted that she had been assaulted by Mallory and they killed him in self-defence. Um, she wasn't believed in court. However, they once the um, court case had kind of closed, Mallory had um, it was found that he had actually previously served a decade long uh, prison sentence for sexual assault. Aline stated that the killing of the five other men had also been self-defence as well. Um, so she was executed by lethal injection on the morning of uh, 9th of October 2002. So again, the reason why I talk about Aline is because this supports the nurture argument because the environment which Aline was surrounded by was chaotic and traumatic and has been argued as being partly to blame for her crimes. Um, you can see this quite um, quite a lot in some of the documentaries around about um, Aline talking about what happened to her in her childhood and, um, and in later life as well. Whereas what the story of Dylan does is it presents the nature argument because despite being in a loving and supportive environment, um, he obviously went on to commit the Columbine shooting. So within the story of Aline, we discussed um, her childhood and some experiences which happened to her and they were thought to impact her behaviour. And there is a lot of work going on currently within criminology um, realm, but also kind of further afield in, in um, health and wellbeing. Um, policing, all sorts of different areas that focus on um, trauma and how that can influence behaviour. So today, um, the majority of academics and researchers believe that both nature and nurture influence um, behaviour and development. So increasingly, people are beginning to realise that asking how much genetics or environment influence a particular trait is probably not the right approach. The, the reality is that there is not a simple way to disentangle the multitude of forces that exist. And these influences include um, genetic factors that interact with one another, environmental factors um, that interact such as social experiences and overall culture, as well as how um, both her um, hereditary and environmental influences intermingle. So what a lot of research focuses on now is um, biological and social causes of crime. Um, so, for example, the way in which we experience the world and we are treated based on our biological makeup. Um, and what's really interesting is that experiences and environment may also impact our biology. So it comes full circle in that respect. Um, in the early 21st century, two significant steps combined to challenge the extreme of these views, because it was still very um, kind of um, con a contested debate, and, and, and really it still is now. But there was two significant steps that um, challenged that the extremity of this and began to generate some consensus around nature versus nurture debate. And these developments were the mapping of the human genome in 2000 and the growing access to MRI scanning of the brain. 
and together what they have done is led to greater scientific information about the psychological, psychobiological and neurological phenomena that occur in the early stages of life. So what that means is that understanding has begun to shift to recognising that perhaps an individual's development is not due to either nurture or nature, but rather it's a set of processes through which the genetic potential unfolds via the environment. So that is nature via nurture. Um, and Fonagy in 2003 um, set the scene for an inquiry into the motivation to offend by saying that biological predisposition and social influence do not create destructiveness, but rather compromise the social processes that normally regulate and tame it. Um, so I'm, I want to um, tell you a little bit more about um, our programme at Glendore um, and what you can expect, but I just wondered if there was any specific questions around the nature and nurture debate at all or any comments on the case studies? So this is a good time everyone to put questions into the um, chat and then I can read them out. So if you've got any questions, put them in. And um, sometimes in, in, people need a little bit more time to think. So um, if you think of a question while Tegan's talking about the different opportunities um, at a university, that's absolutely fine. Just put them in the chat and then we can look at them in a second then. Yeah, that's we've got a mixture here. Sorry, Tegan. We've got a mixture here of your 11s, um, and 12s and year 13. So we've got some year 11s that have, are interested in the topic but may not have studied much on it. And then we've got some year 12s that know a little bit more because they may have studied it and, and maybe some year 13s that know a lot more because they've studied it more and stuff like that. But okay. um, so everyone put the questions in the in the chat and then we'll be um, and Tegan will be happy to answer them. Absolutely. And if you think of anything in the meantime as well, or, or you think of something later on that you want to ask, I'm more than happy for you to email me and um, I can I can answer your question. And what I'll do then, if it's OK, is I'll, I'll move through um, our what we offer at the university um, and then there'll be some time at the end to also ask any questions as well based on what we've looked at tonight. Um, so. Uh, the Criminology and Criminal Justice programme. So I mentioned at the beginning that um, I actually teach a cross programme. So I teach in policing, uh, I teach in criminology and also in therapeutic childcare. Um, so what we're going to look at specifically tonight is criminology and criminal justice. However, if you do have any questions about the other programmes, I'm more than happy to try and answer you um, if I can. Um, but it, I thought it'd be really, really helpful to go through what we have on offer at Glendore in terms of the criminology um, programme. And this is what you can expect if you come to study with us. So you would study criminology from a range of perspectives, including the social, political and um, psychological effects of crime. Um, what you'd also do is examine criminal law and the workings of magistrates and Crown Courts. Now, it's really, really exciting at Glendore because we're having a bit of a revamp um, of the campus ground. So what we've got now is a mock courtroom um, and it looks very much like how you'd expect a courtroom to look. Um, it has the, uh, the judges stand and um, defendants um, box and all of that, um, all of those bits that you would expect to see in a courtroom. But we also have a law degree at the university now as well. Um, so that means that obviously if you're interested in that aspect, you can go on to study law. Um, but our criminology programme also offers uh, a touch of the law um, element with it as well. Um, and we also have excellent judges and individuals involved in the courts coming in to explain their roles and um, give us an idea of a day in a life of what it is to be a judge. What you'd also be doing is exploring the roles and responsibilities of each of the agencies that make up the criminal justice system. So things like youth justice, probation, the prisons, um, all of those different elements, third sector organisations. And in that respect, you'd also be taking part in site visits. So as I said, we have got our mock courtroom. Um, but we appreciate that it's not a real courtroom. So what you would do in your first year is go on a visit to a magistrate's court um, and then in, a, in your second year you'd visit a Crown Court. And you can watch a case um, take place in that respect as well and see how what it's like within 
both of those settings. Um, it's quite different to see a case in a Crown Court in comparison to a Magistrates Court. Crown Court deals with much more serious cases um, and the layout is, is quite different as well. We also take um, our students on um, visits to HMP Berwyn, which is the local prison. Um, and what the students do on those visits is they walk around the prison, um, walk around kind of the grounds, the premises, have a look at what's um, available. So um, the college inside, the education programme, but they also have the opportunity to speak to some of the men who are serving sentences at um, the prison and talk to them about their experiences. Um, I know I've mentioned that we have judges come in to visit um, through the law programme, but we also have these um, coming in for the criminology programme, as well as police officers, um, probation staff and youth justice staff. It's worth knowing as well, if you are interested in policing, um, we, ha we do have a separate policing programme and it's um, it's all retired police officers that run, the, apart from me, I'm not a retired police officer, but they run um, the policing programme at Glindor and they have uh, such a wealth of experience and knowledge. Um, and you'll also automatically become members of the Criminology uh, Society. So this is a society run by students for students. And what that means is that you um, will get to go on extracurricular uh, trips and activities. So uh, what they've done in the past is visit different prisons, um, usually old Victorian prisons that aren't um, in, in use anymore and they have um, a tour around them. They visited um, Manchester Police Museum. I think we're organising a, um, a ghost tour in Liverpool in, during the summer um, and looking at going to London on the Jack the Ripper tour. So they do lo loads and loads of trips, but they also have, um, again, lectures, guest lectures that come in and talk to our students about different um, aspects of the criminology um, and criminal justice uh, field of work. They run debates, so um, uh, uh, one of the main debates that I can remember from my time as a student, because I was also a student on the programme myself, was um, a debate about HMP Berwyn when it was being built um, and what people thought about prison sentences in general, so they have really interesting debates. Um, they also offer training as well, so our students have been really lucky this year because They've had the opportunity to have um, domestic abuse training um, via Women's Aid, which has been a brilliant opportunity for them. And they've also had emotional resilience training. So you get all of that extra um, curricular um, activity and opportunity just by being a criminology student because you're automatically enrolled uh, through that. And it's really um, it's quite interesting that we're meeting today as well because we've had a really brilliant day. Um, we have a crime scene day every year, which is um, this year it was online and it was online last year. Well, part, partly online this year and partly face to face, actually. So we were on campus today with um, lots and lots of people and it was a murder mystery. So every year there's a murder mystery. Um, there's lots of drama students that get involved and create um, crime scenes and also um, do pieces to camera and police interviews. Then we have our policing students that interview them live um, and we have police officers coming in and talking about it from a policing perspective. We have forensic science um, students and forensic scientists coming in to look at um, blood splatters and footprints and all of that um, interesting stuff. And then we also have um, criminology talking about um, crime theories. So it's a really, really interesting day. Um, and at six o'clock, we've got the big reveal of who done it, who is the murderer, where there's a prize. So our Criminology Society are running the, um, the who done it part of the day. But it's a really great day that we have every year um, that students really get involved with and spend the whole day playing Sherlock Holmes and trying to work out who the murderer was. Um, so we have loads and loads of excellent excellent um, activities that happen on campus and, and around campus and it's a really passionate learning environment as well so uh, the lectures bring theory to life by discussing real life cases like we've done like we've done tonight really um, we talk about real life cases and we talk about how um, they relate to criminology theories because um, actually that really helps to bring the theory to life as I say, you have the opportunity to visit working prisons, uh, magistrate court, crown court, 
um, and it's a chance to really increase your employability because we have excellent external links with the criminal justice system in terms of volunteering, gaining um, work experience, work placements, but also employment. We have, um, gosh, we have so many criminal justice agencies that that come to us specifically asking for our students because of how professional they are. Um, and that means that they get that opportunity really, really quickly. Um, and we get that out to them, you know, all the time. There's always opportunities for employment, uh, which is just wonderful for our students. So I really want to share with you our current rankings as well, um, which we're incredibly proud of at Glyndor. So this is for our criminology programme. We've been ranked first in the UK uh, for student satisfaction, um, first for teaching quality and first in Wales across criminology um, subject league tables. So we're really proud of that and we often sit back as a team and think, well, how are we doing this well with our rankings? It's um, we've had these rankings for a few years now in different areas um, and we think that the main reason is because every single student is a person to us is an individual um, we you know absolutely um, work with the students on an individual basis and get to know them as people and also then provide them with excellent opportunities to take part in um, different activities if there's a particular area that they're interested in we'll make sure that they um, have information about that and have an opportunity to get involved so we really get to know them um, as people and what we also do is offer a really supportive environment so we understand that life happens we understand that um, you know sometimes things go go a little bit wrong in life and we put things in place to help our students complete their studies and um, and actually feel um, you know able to complete studies and, and attend lectures on campus. Uh, we have lots and lots of support in place across the whole university, but also as a team as well. We have a really supportive network where we meet with our students regularly. Um, you'll have a personal tutor as a student with us, which means that you meet with them at least three times a year to discuss anything that might be going on in your life. It might not be in relation to your study, but actually it might be impacting your study. So you're very well looked after um, at Glyndor University, which is really lovely. Um, and as I say, we, we're having revamps to the campus, so it's looking uh, even um, more wonderful every time I seem to visit at the minute. We have a, a lovely little space called the Beehive, and it's bee themed, as you can imagine, with lovely little um, honeycomb, um, wall decorations and little spaces where students go and have um, a little bit of time to study by themselves or have meetings and it's looking like there's lots and lots of spaces like that across campus which is really nice. So what I've done here is I have um, popped on our social media accounts um, so you can give those a follow if you would like to we post lots and lots of content on there, uh, lots of um, events that we have coming up so today you'll see that there's loads on there about the crime scene day um, and bits and pieces around that but we also post on there if you've got any upcoming um, events so in the summer we're running a series of um, workshops on serial killers and serial consumerism of them which is a bit of a mouthful to say um, so we're looking at um, how serial killers are portrayed in film and what the cases um, behind those films are those masterclasses are for those aged 18 plus um, however we have lots and lots of events for anybody under the age of 18 to join in as well and i've also popped on there our um, glindor university website so you can take a look at the criminology and criminal justice program on there it gives you a little bit of information about some of the modules um, that you you will be studying and um about the university in general really so you can see some pictures and you can watch some videos of our current students watch videos of some of our staff members so you can just get a feel for what the university is like um am i best off unsharing now john so i can take any yeah, questions yeah absolutely yeah that's fine thank you so much this is brilliant and i i went i i saw today because i was i was looking today and it comes up on my feed because um we follow you and um, I saw that you've done the events today and um, there's so much great opportunities and, you know, your department is just outstanding. There's just so much um, opportunities for everyone and and um, and the resources are brilliant. And these would be great for year 11, 12 or year 13 students 
who are thinking, well, what am I going to do after I leave sixth form? Or what am I going to do? Um, what am I going to apply for when I'm at sixth form to actually gain experience and gain knowledge? And we, we keep pushing this idea of exploring as many different subjects as you can so you can find what the, what the right pathway is for you. Absolutely. And we always recommend with our students to um, do the same with their employment. So we have the opportunity for students to volunteer throughout the programme. And what's wonderful about the criminology programme is actually um, some of the modules are core, which means you have to do them, but then you, the other um, modules are optional. So that means you choose which modules you like the sound of, so you can tailor the degree to your interests. Um, and there are some, honestly, I'm probably biased, I know because I'm a student and now staff member, but the modules are really, really interesting and fascinating and they cover a range of areas like forensic psychology, um, policing, terrorism, loads and loads of different areas that um, you might you know, possibly be interested in and then applying that to practice as well. So we map out our degree programme um, in accordance with um, what's called the um, IQIP, which is the probation qualification, uh, PQIP, sorry. And um, that means that if you do decide to go into probation, once you finish with us, you will be doing um, less time on that qualification because it's mapped out against our degree programme. So that's really, really excellent. Um, but as I say, we've got loads of really good links with the criminal justice system anyway, um, so that you can get those um, work placements, you can get those volunteer placements. But we also get organisations emailing us all the time saying, we've got this role. Is anyone, you know, do you know anybody who might be suitable? Can you share with your students? So we're always sharing job opportunities as well. Um, and we do that on our social media accounts. So it's worth following us on there for that reason too. Great. And some of our, our because we offer psychology, which is one of our most popular subjects, and also in a criminology. So we have lots of students who do both. The criminology course is, is, is different to psychology. Psychology is all exams. And with the criminology, there's exams and controlled assessments. And lots some of our students have opted for criminology because they like the way that that is, the fact that it's not just based on exams. Is the criminology courses your university, is it um, similar in the way they structure the course in terms of sort of um, assignments uh, as, and, as, and with a certain percentage on exams or is it quite heavily exams? No, absolutely not. So um, uh, again, it's a scenario we're really proud of. We have a range of um, different assessment um, mechanisms that we use. So there are a couple of exams, so it, it's module dependent. So some modules um, are exam assessed some yeah. are um, traditional essay assessed, um, some are posters, um, some are presentations, some are group presentations. So we have a real mixture of assessments which our students really love because quite often they'll say, oh I didn't think I was going to do very well in that exam but actually I was really good in the exam or I'm really good at writing essays so they do really well in those. And some of our students actually um, pick the modules based on the type of assessment that it is. So oh, my advice is to always pick the module that you're most interested in. But um, for some students, they actually prefer to, to base it on the type of assessment if they feel like, you know, for example, if they might be a bit anxious and they don't want to do a group presentation or a post presentation, they might pick another module that doesn't involve that. So we have a real mixture, uh, which is beneficial. Brilliant. And um... In terms of what people go into afterwards, do you tend to have quite a high percentage sort of go into a field using their degree in terms of going? Yeah, because yeah. like for some degree courses, the percentage is quite low where people obviously develop lots of skills and go into a completely different field. But do you find there's quite a high percentage going into sort of the, the sort of probation, criminology, those sort of fields? It afterwards? Is. Absolutely. And the reason being is that um, criminology covers so many um so many areas in terms of employment because we obviously have the traditional um, employment which was kind of more focused say a few years ago things like probation policing um, youth justice uh, in the prisons we still have all of those and, and we have you know Berwyn right on our doorstep so there's loads of opportunities there but what we also have now is links with um, third sector organizations that are very much tied in to um, uh, tied into the criminology skills that you learn on our programme. So things like working for victim support, which is a third sector organisation, women's aid, um, homelessness charity, housing, quite a lot of our students go uh, then go into housing. So there's a range um, of students that go into different areas and 
the friends that I made on my um, time at the university as an undergraduate student have all gone into some area of um, the criminal justice system in whatever form that might be. Um, in fact, one of my friends is a caseworker for within HMP Berwyn looking at resettlement. So looking at uh, once people leave prison, putting support in place to help them along that journey. So yeah, there's absolutely a oh, great brilliant. benefit for our students. We've got a question. What subjects would you recommend as being beneficial for your degree program? So if you pick, if you were, cause you've got your 11s here who might be thinking, mm -hmm. What subjects? Obviously, would it obviously psychology would be useful and criminology would be useful, but are there other subjects that complement them quite well? Yeah, I mean, um, criminology and psychology is probably the main ones. Um, we do get some students come in uh, having done forensics. Um, we also get students coming in who might not have done that much in relation to criminology, really, um, but they still kind of they if they they find that they're interested in it once they finish but I would definitely say criminology psychology anything um if you've got sociology um or those kinds of subjects so those in kind of the um social realms would be would be uh, handy to have on you know when you join us but I we have eleven that are there I'm going to say we've obviously got human lots of humanities we've we, we've run loads of humanities because we do psychology business economics um, politics, history, geography. So we've got those subjects, but we've also got applied. We also run like applied science and stuff like that, which has forensic modules. So you would do a forensic module in applied science where they have a crime scene and they look at they look at the, a crime scene and they analyze that. So that obviously those skills, science is going to complement it quite well, aren't they? In the sense that you're going to use your analytical skills and your problem solving skills as well. Um, and well, just to compliment what Tegan said, if you're an 11 student, just do what you enjoy. You've got to really pick subjects you enjoy and and, and um, the opportunities will come from that. You know, if you really, you know, don't sometimes pick subjects just because you think, OK, um, I have to do this. I want to pick, I'm going to be doing these subjects for a long time and you've got to enjoy them in terms of that. Yeah, absolutely. You have to enjoy it. And that's where your passion, you know, comes from. And, you know, it's important to kind of keep that going, really. So um, another question would be, um, would additional literacy based subjects in terms of if you were doing anything that's you know literacy in terms of english and stuff like that in terms of your essay writing and your, your obviously would that would those skills be useful for your course yeah absolutely absolutely so um obviously there are quite a bit of um, quite a bit of essay writing in our assessment so um that's always beneficial um such a great question as well by the way so thank you um that would definitely be beneficial and um, what I would say as well is we get students from a range of backgrounds. So we have some um, students who have left um, uh, college or sixth form, but we also have mature students. So what that means is you're with students who have a range of different skills. Um, and what we find is um, if you come from, say, sixth form, um, you're quite skilled up with your essay writing, which is really beneficial when you come to join us because you've got some of those skills that that you need to at least start off um, submitting good quality work. Brilliant. Um, the other thing I was going to say was we are always at the moment we're trying to um, encourage them to obviously read around the subject and stuff like that. So if you were looking at exploring criminology, are there any sort of uh, I know you've talked about some cases today. Are there some sort of good um, wider reading that would be great? Something that year 12 or year 13 students could get their teeth into that would sort of give them some wider knowledge that would help them um, when they went on to a criminology course? Absolutely. So there's quite a few books out there and um, there's quite a few introduction to criminology books. So I'd recommend getting your hands on one of those. My favourite is the um, Peter Joyce one. So okay. the introduction to criminology by Peter Joyce, but there are a few out there. So um, it might be helpful to have a look and see, have a read of the back um, or the blurb of the book, and then you get a feel for how that author writes. Um, what I like about Peter Joyce is he makes it very accessible. So even if you haven't got much um, kind of knowledge around criminology at the minute, what Peter Joyce does is he presents it in a way that will help you really understand it. Um, and we always recommend people buying that book when they come study with us. Um, we have a range of recommended reading lists that you'll be provided with as well prior to joining um, and lots of out. So we have a Criminology Society page, um, social media pages, sorry, and they um, also 
have books on there that they are they're either given away that students aren't using anymore or they um, selling. Fab. And um, follow up question: Would you encourage wider reading in sociological and psychological theories to help understand crimin criminality? Absolutely, yeah. So we do have uh, obviously some criminology uh, criminology theories are slightly different. Um, however, they do um, interrelate and over overlap across the um, subject areas. And actually, one of the modules that I'm teaching at the moment, um, attachment, trauma, and crime we've got somebody who studied psychology before and she's found it really useful using her psychology textbooks um, because some of the theory that we speak about is actually within those textbooks um, so yeah that that would really be quite useful because it would give you that broader understanding then and we do encourage our students to read widely around the topic area fab i know we've got a we are conscious of time and i know that um is is um three minutes past six but i'm just gonna ask one last question you know um Lots of our students say that they got their first interest with the criminology and they decided to pick it by getting hooked on lots of the crimin um, criminology documentaries on Netflix and stuff like that. And that. Are they a good starting point? In terms yeah, of, yeah, yeah, I uh, mean, uh, we tend to, in our um, programme, we tend to talk about some of those documentaries, um, to, be, to be honest, because we have access to them all the time. And um, Netflix is has been bringing out some excellent ones um, lately on different um, cases. So you'll find you're in good company um, because we all have a really good interest in all of those documentaries. Um, so yeah, they're a good place to start as well. You can absolutely do that. There's also some really good um, podcasts available. So I think there's one called Bad People. And that's quite a funny podcast, um, but it talks about different cases. Uh, there's some YouTube channels as well that talk about uh, criminological cases so that again they're really good to kind of have a look at and really boost your knowledge before you um, come and study with us but right. having said that you'll get that from us as well so and what we do is we've got a guide of sort of super curricular stuff where we've done it for every subject so we'll what we'll do is we'll add those podcasts to it yeah and the books or whatever and um, that was great thank you so much um, Tegan for giving me the time this evening we really appreciate thank you so much and what we'll do is we'll send a copy of this video to um, all the students um, in, in, in terms of what we'll, we'll, um, we'll send a copy so everyone can watch it because that was fantastic. Thank you ever so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for um, taking part, everyone. It's been a pleasure to um, see you all this evening. OK, yeah. have a nice evening, everyone. Take um, care. Bye, Tegan. Bye, everyone. See you all tomorrow. World Book Day tomorrow, everyone. World Book Day tomorrow.